Hello everyone and welcome to this best of two game. Really looking forward to this one. It looks like it's going to be a very exciting game. Uh, it's actually my first time casting for Gaelic Gaming, so hopefully I won't mess up too badly. And if I do, I do apologise. I'm casting today with Voa. Uh, he's my co-caster. He's going to be doing our play-by-play -play today. Uh, do you want to say anything, Voa? Um, nah, not much. Except that they're seeing like some real targeted bands come out here. Cassidy and Leona, both extreme targeted bands. I think Fizz is also one. And Vayne's just... Is Vayne a really standard band still, or what's going on? Yeah. I've been out of the scene for a while. Vayne still is really still standard. Vayne is still very strong, especially if you get Blade of the Moon King on her. That extra attack speed with the lifesteal is just exceptionally strong. So, banned mm. out mostly because teams tend to be able to get it to late game if they really try hard, and so you want to ban her out. Mm. Uh, one interesting thing to mention is that all of, I believe, Zeri's, or no, no, Yumko, is the mid, I think? for Team Parabellum, and we're seeing nothing but mid lane champions banned out here. And a Corky first pick. With yeah, Ezreal still in the pool, I think that's a bit weird. Uh, it, it would have seemed weird to me if it is two weeks ago or so, but now that Triforce has been buffed so tremendously and Corky's mana costs have actually been slightly reduced, it's a very strong AD carry. You get the extra movement hmm. speed, which, although in the most recent patch the movement speed from Phage with a ranged champion was reduced to half, so it's only 30 extra movement speed on killing a unit, it's still a good movement speed buff and helps Corky be a bit less squishy and be a bit more mobile in teamfights. <laughs> Alright, that's certainly very interesting. Um, is it on kill or just on hit? On hit you phage? get 20 movement speed, and on kill you get 30 movement speed. Is that 30 bonus on the 20? Yep. I thought... Oh, that's very interesting. No, no, wait, um, you get you get 30 movement speed, you don't get an extra 50. Oh, okay, oh, okay. okay. I was thinking like extra 50 movement speed would be insane. Yeah, that would be uh, very strong. Yeah, and we're seeing potentially Jungle Sejuani come out. She's a very, very good team fight initiator. She's got a lot of uh, powerful options, but then again, so does Jarvan. He yeah, as, soon much, as, I, hmm? as soon as you start talking about someone, they're always going to be changed at the last moment. <laughs> yeah. so. Except for Caitlyn, she's just a really strong AD carry. Her poke is insane just because she can sit back at 600 plus range and fire off Pilt over Peacemaker. And once you wander into that 600 range, she starts hitting you with her auto attacks. And they hurt like the dickens, especially if he gets that headshot off. Mm -hmm. Ooh, interesting picks here between well, Nasus and Lee Sin. Lee Sin, relatively common... Um, a relatively common pick in the jungle, if you, especially if you can get the mobility going, get a couple of early kills, which is mm -hmm. something you can do with a Corky lane. Like if you played Corky Zyra, Corky Sona, they're both very good early level burst lanes. I wouldn't expect to see a melee champion, I wouldn't expect to see sort of the, the Corky Leona, which is a good burst lane as well, just because <laughs> Kaelin is really going to harass people down in that lane. Mm. Annie actually getting hovered over here now. It could be a Tarbe Annie support, you know, the sort of uh, Royal Club gaming title, but I expect it to be an Annie mid if it does get locked in. It should be an Annie mid, and I believe top lane at least, would you say? Because I think Jarvan does better in the jungle. He's more uh, rapidly mobile for ganks. Ah, it, yeah, definitely going to be a Renekton top now. Ooh, brother against brother in top lane. Yeah, I think Renekton is very strong against Nasus early game. Just Nasus does have that soul eater passive, which gives you the extra fifteen percent uh, life. Uh, uh, sorry, fourteen percent life steal, thirty percent life, uh, seventeen percent life steal, and twenty percent life steal mm -hmm. as it ranks up. But yep. Renekton has a lot of extra damage, especially with that ignite. You can use that call the meek, the ruthless predator to get in there and stun him down, and then slice mm -hmm. and dice around, chasing Nasus through the wither, which is the major point that means that Nasus is unkillable in lane. If you can get past mm -hmm. the wither, you can kill a Nasus. Yep, definitely. And we're seeing Thresh get picked up here. I would be surprised if they changed out the Thresh for another support. Like, we were talking about it just before we came on stream, that uh, the death sentence has had an increase in its cooldown if it whiffs. Um, mm -hmm. But, like, it's never the cooldown that's been a threat. It's always just the death sentence itself. It's the threat of that hook coming in and you being immobile and unable to cast spells, unable to move yourself for a full like second and a half, and then having a Thresh on top of you, flaying you, putting the box on you. It's always just a huge threat. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what kind of cooldown you give that, as long as the threat is still there. Like, the best Thresh is the one that doesn't use their hook, and that just threatens with the hook. Because yeah. it inspires such fear in you that you're just like, I'm gonna just not even in this lane anymore. Especially versus a Caitlyn, if you can get her to the point where she has to use her 90 caliber net before you use your hook, then your hook is guaranteed because you just pass it, like cast it along the line of 90 caliber net. It has slightly longer range than it, and she's going to be standing still at the end of that for probably about a quarter of a second. I know it doesn't sound like a long time, but it's more than enough time for that hook to land. 
put them in, and then you can flay as well. Um, it does look like it's going to be a bot lane Annie Caitlyn combination. Now, Annie, you can charge up that stun, which is really strong, but I'm not sure about it as sort of a counter to Thresh Corky. I think Thresh Corky is probably going to do more damage and probably going to win in this bottom lane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like Annie's auto range is also extremely short, if I'm not mistaken. Am I? Uh, it's actually, it's like... no, it's 650. It's one of is the longest 600? in the game. Yep. Jesus. 650. 650. That is. I completely. Yeah. I... I guess I'm not used to seeing an Annie auto, and I always assume an Annie auto is the same range as her Q, which is way, way shorter. Yeah. That's about 450, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's what a, the range I was going off of rather than her auto mm. range. 650. Wow. That is good poke. Actually, I, I've just looked it up, and dis the disintegrate, that's the Q, is 625, so all of Annie's skills what? have quite a long range. Yeah, it's unexpected. Jesus. Maybe it's because she's so short that she doesn't seem to have a, as long a range, but it is mm -hmm. very, very long. That's uh, that's pretty efficient. And we're seeing both supports taking Ignite. Yeah, oh, that's going to be interesting. Last second change over there from Yucatan. He's taking Teleport instead of Ignite with uh, his Lysandra. That's her name, yeah. isn't it? I'm not getting yeah. that wrong. Yes. Yes, yeah, it's, it's Lissandra, it's Lissandra. It looks like it's going to be actually a mid lane Lissandra, which isn't the most commonly seen mid laner in the world, especially against mm -hmm. um, the more bursty mid laners like Agragas, who can uh, move you around the battlefield quite a bit. Lissandra's probably going to try and use her glacial path to get away from that Gragas yeah. and be able to mobilize herself using teleport to get in, glacial tomb someone, lock them up, and then be able to get the damage down. But. Yeah. Gragas does have the ability to knock people out of teleports with the explosive cast. Also, if mm -hmm. you body slam someone on someone, it uh, reduces their movement speed, and if you use a bow, it actually reduces their attack speed. So that's going to be an interesting sort of uh, combination. If you can get onto people, maybe he'll be able to uh, sort of remove their damage in the in the fight that they're teleporting to. Mm -hmm. In this game, I'm reckoning that Power are going to have to look out for the double TP coming in at any point, like any kind of key objective comes up, we're going to see Team Fluke just instantly being all over them. Mm -hmm. uh, like when dra the second dragon comes up, I imagine that all of uh, Team Fluke are going to be on top of that dragon, so Para really need to be watching the timers very, like a hawk. Um, if there's one thing I remember from watching Fluke in previous games, is that they are very, very aware of key objectives. They know when they need to be getting dragon, they know when they need to be taking towers off it. So bot lane is always going to be in uh, a lot of trouble for Para, simply because Team Fluke are always going to be putting the pressure on down there. Yeah. So um, having the long range of Annie and the long range of Caitlyn simply means that they'll be slightly safer than, say, the Thresh Corky, who are, I want to say, 500 and something range? Um, I'm not sure. I think Thresh, I think Thresh is, is 475. Yeah, sounds about right to me, and Corky is about 525, I think. We can look it up for us and make sure we get that right, because I wouldn't want to tell you guys anything that wasn't true, obviously. So just yeah. have a quick check on that one. Um, it's going to be interesting to see. I, I've talked a little bit about this Lissandra lane, and I think that's really going to be where this game is won and lost, because if Gragas can get a couple of early kills, he has better roaming altogether than... Um, than Lissandra does, even with that teleport. Yes, Lissandra can use Glacial Path to get up into other fights, but Gragas puts a lot more damage down when he gets there. I think what we'll see is Lissandra building sort of a Rod of Ages build, trying to get a bit of extra tankiness and a bit of extra damage so she can get into the middle of team fights, which is where you want Lissandra to be able to activate that Ring of Frost and the Glacial Tomb. But Gragas can go for a Rabadons, a Leandres if he wants, with a Haunting Guys. Maybe his own Rod of Ages if he's building sort of a, a, a more old school uh, Gragas build. But now that we've seen Faker play it, I think what he'll be doing is for the very high burst uh, burst Gragas. Mm -hmm. uh, most likely. It'll, it'll be interesting to see how these lanes actually play out. Like, It could be a case that Lissandra may lose the lane simply because Gragas is more bursty than her and reaches his kind of uh, high points of damage slightly more quicker than she does. But careful use of teleports and being right place right time because of that teleport mm -hmm. could mean that Lysandra could have a bigger impact on the game than Gragas will. After all, it's one thing to be 18 and 0 and it's another thing to be 18 and 0 and halfway across the map when the team fight starts. That's totally true. Um, Ice Bog and Corky, I just, I just want to say Ice Tobog and Corky was made, I think it was for the Quebec Winter Olympics, I think it was. It Quebec. was, yeah. And that is a skin that you see so very rarely. I mean, usually I don't talk about skins just because it doesn't really contribute that much to the game, but <laughs> Ice Toboggan Corky is just wow. 
wow right there. So we that's, are into that's the, old school. Uh, yeah, we are into the loading screen, guys. Just waiting on everyone to load on up. If you were going to predict any level one action, what would you be? What would you be thinking here, Boa? <clears throat> the level one on Fluke is very powerful. They have mm -hmm. access to Wither if they wanted, which they probably won't use, but they do. They will always have access to Death Sentence, which is pretty big. Lysandra's damage at level 1 shouldn't really be overlooked, but they don't have... They only have a single Ignite on their team versus uh, Para's three Ignites. Also, Para will probably have any charge her stun before leaving the Fountain, I want to say, yeah. just because it adds an awful lot of threat at the early game, which means that she's they're at least carrying one stun around. Jarvan's early game damage should never really be underestimated, especially with his Q. Lee Sin will have access potentially to Q or E. If he has access to E, that's a lot of slow that can be used to kind of couple in with a bit of damage off of Corky. Um, Corky has the option of taking his E at level 1, which means that everyone's damage is amplified. Though I don't think we're going to see that, simply because the use of Phosphorescent... Phosphorescent Cloud? Phosphorus phosphorescent bomb. Burst? Phosphorescent Bomb. Phosphor Bomb is one of his preferred options in lane, simply because it's uh, a lot of upfront burst damage that's difficult to just reply to, because he just instantly mm. throws it on you, and it's like, there you are, here's 300 damage. Bye. Yeah. Um... One thing that can't be forgotten about Corky as well is the Hextech Shrapnel Shells, which is its passive, and it gives you that 10 extra true damage each time you make an, each time you hit an auto attack, which is one of the main reasons we see Corky play as an AD carry rather than an AP carry, because if you get enough attack mm -hmm. speed, like every second that's an extra 30 damage, oh, not 30, probably, if you get 2.0 attack it's speed, it's an extra 20 true damage every second, so... It's 10% of his attack damage is true oh, damage. Oh, is it 10%? Okay, I thought it was... Yeah, it's 10% 10 of his... Nope. It's 10% of his uh, attack as bonus true damage, which is why combinational attack speed and damage items are really key on him. All right, and nobody's off the fountain yet. Uh, we are Motai. onto the rift, though, and we're just going to reorganize our champions down at the bottom here, making sure that everyone is in the right order. I'm also going to turn off chat, because I find sometimes if you leave chat on, it's a little bit dangerous, especially when you are watching... Uh, people play who might not like each other, who might like each other, you never know. So, a couple of things coming out here. Just going to take our sound down a little bit as well, guys. Sorry about that. Here we are. Mm -hmm. And people are just travelling down the rift, having a look around, seeing what's happening. Uh, it's Fluke versus Power Bell in gaming, and we see Havgez actually just standing in this bush. Might get caught out a little bit. No one's seen him go in, but you never know if he's going to get caught out. Mm -hmm. And he has not taken the skill point yet, so he could use Flash, he could use Safeguard if he needed to. He's put a couple of hits on Gragas, and he's taken Resonating Strike. I don't think he's got to follow that up. It would be kind of dangerous. After all, he doesn't know that the rest of Power Bell and Gaming are down in the south end of the map. It looks like they're going for a long loop around into the red buff. Mm -hmm. and this is a pretty nice threat that they can do to the enemy team. It also guarantees a red buff early for Lee Sin, which is uh, a really core buff on him. It means yeah. he can swing directly to blue buff after. I think you still get level 3 if you clear out the mini minions as well, mm -hmm. um, and that's like a level 3 Lee Sin, 2 minutes and 2 and a half minutes in, coming into your lane, or 3 minutes in even, coming into your lane and upsetting you. And we're gonna see Flash oh. with Death Sentence, unfortunate. Yeah, just missed there, nice slice and dice away by Cyber Boy ITT, I'm gonna call him Cyber Boy because that makes sense to me. Uh, nice flash away there by Cyber Boy. They're going to get away with this red buff, but if you look at the counters we made coming out here, going to be able to steal it, the opposing team's red buff away as well. Mm -hmm. um, so they just got to trade red buffs on this. Corky in a little bit of danger, um, but he does still have a slash, he does still have his uh, God, barrier. And it looks like he's going to find Zarius here, but Zarius is going to just get out. Um, it's important to remember, like, oh, Death Sense is coming out and missing there. Um, if they chased that a bit too far, it would have been a 3v2 with a level 2 Zeris with red buff, and you really don't want to do that in all honesty. I think Corky was a bit too manly there. Mm -hmm. He was a little bit uh, trying to show off his guns, but not exactly working out there. Um, interestingly <laughs> enough, Zeris has actually cleared out the camp for Fluke, whereas uh, Havgets did not clear out the last uh, little lizard. And we're seeing a pink ward getting burned here early to try and maintain superiority in that brush, which is something really landing. Odd. Very good dead sentence there, but no follow-up. Uh, just a little bit too far gone. But like I was saying, is you want to maintain control of that brush early, uh, especially as a thresh, just so that you have just the potential of being a huge threat and just always being hanging out there. Um, we talked about the damage that's going to come down in this top lane, and we see it from Cyberboy TT there. 
getting some damage down onto his brother, managing to get Ethelus down to about three quarters health. But you look at it, Ethelus popped that red pot, he's got that crystalline flask as well. Zerus is coming in from the side, nice move to his predator there. Yup, it's gonna be the first blood. Huge, huge damage there, just from the knock up with uh, Zerus being level three, four? He's level three, and. Just Renekton's damage output is insane. Um, between Cull the Meek, his stun with the Spreader, and Slice and Dice, he can output a lot of damage up front. Um, oh. And we're seeing a really nice run come out of the uh, uh, mid lane as well. Oh, the knock up. The knock up was amazing there. He timed it just so that uh, Lysander was not going to be able to get out. Um, just really, really well timed on his part. And Lysander could have popped the teleport early, but she still would have been in huge danger there. Yeah, I'm gonna and see. The massive would have knocked yeah. out. Yeah, bot lane his engage as well. Oh wow. Finally a counter kill. A fluke showing that they're actually here to play the game and not just give kills away the entire time. Um, this is a really dodgy position for Caitlyn to be in. Would you agree there or Yeah, I totally agree. Like, um, two on one. Doesn't want to be near that death sentence. Yes, she has got 90 caliber nets and would be able to escape a little bit, but death sentence into Flay can knock you out of your 90 caliber nets. And you have to remember that Johnny will have Valkyrie as well. Actually, Zerus is coming across here, and if he's able to get a counter engage, this would be very good for them because they might be able to get a couple of kills. There aren't any wards in this river. Vortex has used both of his pink wards, but you look at this half is still standing here in this bottom bush. Those pink wards, wards really helping out. Here comes Vortex, he's gonna get caught out. Death Sentence missing the arms of Vortex Peter. Not quite able to get enough damage down. Zeris is gonna have to back away. Nice pose over Peacemaker as well. Ignite's gone down. He might go down to that Ignite, not quite able to get it, and they all escape. Sorry, I just realized I just totally did your job there for a second, but uh, oh, no, that's grand, like You've led into the play, into the play, and I think any instance of me trying to come in there would have just kind of stood on your toes a little bit. In any case, that was a really nice play by both teams. If Hadgets had not been down in that lane, it would have gone completely south for Team Fluke, um, and be like that death sentence whiffing Caitlyn at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, the Jarvan waiting for the death sentence to go off before he went in. It was really, really smart play on both team sides, and it was a good call to pop the ignite and seem like a bigger threat. Like any time you're ignited and you're less than half health, you're always a bit dodgy about continuing the assault. So it was a good call on um, Vortexy to pop it then and there, and still yeah. flay. Jo he flayed Jarvan back towards the brush, which again was a good call. It was away from his team, but it was also away from his escape route. Yeah, we see Offalos come back into this bottom lane. It's picked up the fairy charm and a few wards, but we're actually getting those pink wards and clearing out as much vision as he can. No speed at ticking down the, that damage onto Johnny, getting a bit of it down, but not really as much as he'd like at this point. I pulled over Peacemaker <laughs> would get Johnny quite low, but here comes Half Gears again. Oh, and a really nice go in there by Vortexi. Really good use of death sentence. Nice flash to the nine net, but Fluke Johnny saying, Nope, I came here for a kill, I'm taking your kill. And it looks like Offlo's gonna be forced to burn flash. Muay Thai Leeson almost going down to that. Vortexi super low. Really good aggression coming out there from Team Fluke. They saw their opening, they knew they had to go in when they saw uh, the Caitlyn be a little bit out of position. And even though Caitlyn burned flash and 90 caliber net, she should have still burned the barrier to try and survive there. I don't think she reckoned on Valkyrie Flash cookie dropping a level 3 Phosphorus bomb on her. Like, yeah, you don't, you don't expect oh, that out of the court. You don't always expect those things, but I think she should have probably reacted a bit quicker, getting that barrier off and being able to survive it up. Um, also, that would have probably baited Corky into taking one more tower shot, and that would have been a counter kill for them, so I would mm -hmm. have liked to have seen that. We Actually, see the goal is sort of normalizing the moment. Vortex is going to cross towards this mid lane. He's not going to get anything at the moment. This lane is pushing towards Gragas. He's going to try and farm under his tower. If he lands a hook here, it would be impressive. There's the glacial path. I'm not going to be able to do mm -hmm. anything. Yeah, the Ring of Frost actually has surprisingly small range when you really, really want it to hit. And then when you, the enemy wants it to hit, it has amazing range. Yeah, it's huge range. God damn, my Sandra. Yeah, huge range. Fair and balanced. Um, seeing... Oh, I thought we were going to see Yucatan wander towards bot lane there to try and get something done. Uh, unfortunate for Offalo right there, putting a ward in a brush that was already pr pink warded. So, he's not going to be able to pick that up. Um, both teams are wearing the dragon now. Interestingly enough, I think the ward for Team Fluke is more valuable than the ward for Team Parabellum because they have those two teleports. Mm -hmm. um, now, Nasus's one is down, but it's only down for another 50 seconds. So anytime they want, they can just say, okay, it's time. We're taking Dragon now. Yeah. We're going to change it. We're going to exchange a tower for it. 
and then we're gonna roam bot and take a kill. Or we gotta get a kill in mid, and then we're gonna take dragon for it instantly. Now it's gonna mean that Renekton gets a little bit of extra free. Hmm? Sorry? Yeah, it's like I was gonna say, especially with Nasus on your team, it's so easy to take a quick dragon. You can get that Fury of the Sands out, you do 3% magic damage, 3% um, of the enemy's maximum health magic damage per second. And that's just, you're gonna melt it down really, really quickly. And that's why we see lots of Nasus <laughs> taking dragon by themselves at level 6, because you can do it with that Fury of the Sands ultimate. Yep, it's ridiculously effective. I had a, I think I had a friend who didn't quite know that it was percentage damage. He's like, oh, it's just AOE damage, it's not that great. Then I explained to him, no, no, it's percentage per second that gets converted into attack damage. And he's like, I'm, I'm gonna just go and learn Nasus now, <laughs> just right now. Why is no one else playing Nasus all the time? He's very, very strong. And uh, the other thing about Nasus that I love is the fact that he's one of the few infinitely scaling champions in the game. Talking mm -hmm. like he's got that cycling strike has a hundred and eleven stacks on cycling strike at the moment, and it just lets you just farm up really nicely. And actually, makes it a lot easier to uh, get CS because you can just use your Q and get that extra damage. He has built that Warden's Veil in there, getting a bit of cooldown reduction, getting a bit of mm -hmm. armor as well, just to be able to tank out Cyberboy T I T T, which yep. will like NASA scales a lot better into late game than Manecton does in all honesty. So it'll be interesting to see how those brothers fight it out as this game progresses on. <laughs> It'll probably be a case of Nasus will completely ignore Renekton come team fight time mm -hmm. and just buzz all the way down through to the back line. Um, we're seeing Zeres really intelligently here had pinked up a pink ward, pink ward there and is removing the two wards from Dragon. Mm -hmm. um, this means that it's much more secure for Team Parabellum here and they have a slight advantage still going in but there are still two pink wards just on the rim of Dragon so Nasus can pop down, pop his ghost and run straight into the back line and there's yeah. not much you can do. Um, like, the armor was an interesting choice for him. It's a really good counter to Renekton in lane, since all of Renekton's damage, except for his, uh, in his, the ultimate AoE damage, is mm -hmm. all physical. So having that Warden's Mail, having that potential slow whenever you get hit. Uh, no, it reduces attack speed, so that's really coming in hit bot lane. Yep, alright. So, oh my god, really nice into flash kick there and a really good use of the Jarvan ults trying to keep everyone out and Fluke Johnny picks up one kill there and they're definitely going to transition over to Dragon here but Gragas is coming down and his damage output is immense uh, Nasus teleporting down to try and help out if Gragas has Gragas has ulti he just needs to wheel it in there and throw yep with the Lee Sin unfortunately though so he does not get the kill he wanted Have gets tanking a little bit too much on Dragon he needs to let someone else take over while he tries to get the smite out Fluke Johnny amazing position he comes in behind Zeres and takes him out. Now chasing out the Caitlyn there with the red buff and dropping everything they have on uh, Yumko here up above. Uh, Fluke Johnny not giving up on this Caitlyn, still going in on her, whiffs the ultimate, has to get out. 90 caliber net, a little bit too much damage. The ultimate hits him, does not kill, so he is going to be in a bit of trouble if he hangs around here. Offalo is coming down with the stun. If Offalo peeks his head into that brush, this could be it for Fluke Johnny. Looks yeah, like it might be. Ignite goes down. Flash used by Caitlyn. Questionable there. Yeah, it Good wasn't needed at all. It was well done by Offalo, but the flash definitely wasn't needed. The ignite had gone down already. She flashed in for the kill as well, but he was gonna die anyway. Like Barrier has <laughs> a shorter length than Ignite does, so Ignite takes over a longer period than Barrier stays up. So yeah. he was always gonna die to the Ignite. Mm -hmm. It's like two seconds on Barrier, five seconds on Ignite. Mm -hmm. um, he had chugged a pot, but it was not going to be enough health. It just sim like he had like a sliver of health after Offalo dropped. Uh, what is it? Incinerate and disintegrate at mm -hmm. the same time. So it was just going to be too much for him. So at the end of that, I call it. incintegrate. Yeah. Mm, yes. Uh, we see a plus one coming out for. Ooh, a pause gets called. So this is a good time to just talk about the end of that fight. Yeah. Um, we see the dragon get taken. We see mm -hmm. two kills go up for the for Team Fluke. Yes. Um, Fluke, yeah. And in exchange, Parabellum take one kill. Um, but at the same time, there's only an 800 gold difference. Now that would translate to the two kills, but what about all the dragon gold? Or was it only it, one kill? It was two kills. Zeres went but down. Yeah. And Offalo went down before the fight started. Mm -hmm. If you look down the CS though, that's where this difference is going to be made up. You look at it, the top lane, Cyberboy TT versus, um, I've totally forgotten who's in the top lane, Ethlas. That's 12 CS, and I know that doesn't sound like a huge amount, but 12 CS is equal to about 250 gold. If you look at the mid lane, mm -hmm. 20 CS. Gragas there, Yumko playing Gragas versus Yucatan, 
20 CS is equal to about 400 gold. So that's 600 gold we've made up right now. And I mean, mm -hmm. the rest of it's pretty even, but you get 1,000 gold for Dragon, about 1,000 gold. The uh, extra kill that they've got will give them about 400 gold. So there'll be 800 gold difference with... Uh, so it'll be 1,200 gold difference minus about 400 to 600 gold in CS difference. So that's about 800 gold, and that's how that maths adds up right there. Mm. Yes. yes. All right, so... We're obviously going to see Ruby Sidestones come out from both teams at mm -hmm. some point. Um, but you reckon that it's in Thresh's best interest to rush it faster than Annie? Like, do you think Annie should get a GP5 before getting the Sidestone? Or do you think that rushing Sidestone is still the most efficient thing in the world? I think Annie, I, I was about to say, really needs a Philosopher's Stone first, and that's what she's gone for. Just because, mm -hmm. as Annie, you want to be able to get a couple of damaging items late game, and having the Philo gets you that bit of extra gold per 5, a bit of gold per 10, sorry, and allows you just to um, get those sort of Morello Nomicon items at the late game, which is what you want to be doing as Annie. You can't just be a stun bot late game, because if that's what you're playing for, there were better stun bots than an Annie. You could play a Sona, who has a superb ultimate, and gives you a bit of extra damage, and gives you a bit of extra armor and a heal. Like She plays better than an Annie would do in this case, so you need that little bit of extra damage if you're going to play Annie. Mm -hmm. Alright, we're seeing a really interesting ward come out here from... Uh, see, he's actually pink warded up around the blue pit, the blue uh, golem area there, mm -hmm. just before the buff came back up, so they'll have vision on that. And they'll be able to use that to their advantage. Now, obviously, Yucatan's getting chased out of lane a little bit here by this Abyssal... Uh, abyssal Rod? Abyssal Scepter, Scepter Gragas. Yeah, couldn't remember the name of it at all. I knew it built up a Blasting Rod, and that's where I got confused. But Abyssal Scepter Gragas is really, really good, because he always wants to be so close and always in your face. The uh, Magic Resist Degradation is amazing on him, and half gets to go to walk straight into this. Potentially... Nope, he's just got to let everything walk away. Um, but... Uh, Yumko here is going to try and take his blue buff, but there is a four-man fight about to break out down here. Now, Nasus doesn't have teleport, he uses it for the dragon, and uh, we see Yumko use his ultimate to secure the blue buff there, which is very, very wise on him. He's saying, I don't want to fight this 3v4. I don't want, mm -hmm. uh, or even 4v4, sorry, but 4v4 when I have no mana. I'm just going to burn the ultimate, and we're going to be done here. And we're seeing yes. a rotation to mid by bot lane. They're going to just try and take this tower out here. Which is a pretty good call on their part, because they're mm -hmm. well ahead in their own lane. And taking this mid tower gives the jungler a lot more roam potential. It gives Yucatan a lot more roam potential. And the ability and to get out and about. That's what you want to so do when you see a mid laner use their ultimate to uh, secure a buff. Like, if you know he hasn't got that displacement, he hasn't got that extra damage, you want to take an objective. So they've almost managed to get that mid lane tower down. It's down to about 300 health or so. Should be able to get it down on the next push. They have given up a bit of CS in that bot lane and lost the turret, but it was going to go down anyway, and you just have to accept that sometimes. Yuktan getting his own blue buff, going to be able to spam those spells a little bit more. Obviously, Lissandra's passive giving you a free spell at every about 16 seconds, I believe. I think it's 18 at uh, first rank and 16 later. Half gets not getting engaged upon, though. Oh! Dear, what was Hafkes doing under there when uh, Jarvan was still around? Like, they saw the Jarvan Spear drop at their own blue buff uh, when Yucatan was recalling, so he, they knew he must still be around in that area. And it looks like they're trying to trade on tower again. This would give them a pretty big advantage for Team Parabellum if they can take two towers back to back. Um, now, that top tower is obviously at half health because mm -hmm. uh, at the early to mid stages, Renekton is just a way better pusher than Nasus. Using Cull the Meek is just what he wants to do the whole time. It restores his HP, it does AoE damage. Um, the Furied version is extremely effective at doing huge amounts of damage. Um, so obviously that's... He wants to keep the lane push, and he doesn't really mind if Lee Sin pops up for a gank, because Slice and Dice... Offload getting hooked in on here, but obviously not going to go in with no creeps yeah. under the tower. Yeah, you're We're not going to jump in yep. there as Thresh. Like, it's a bit too dangerous if you're Vortexy to go in there, especially since Offload had that stun ready was waiting, basically, for Vortexy to jump in. Summon Tibbers was up as well, as was Ignite. Vortex, that would have been a death sentence for Vortexy if he'd followed up on it, so... Um, well, hey, hey. Hey, I'm a funny man. <laughs> Cyberboard TC just pushing out this top lane. The problem for him is, if he gets too close to the turret, Ethelus can just walk towards him, Sunfire Cape damage will proc, and then he will start tanking tower shots. So, one good <clears> thing about Sunfire Cape is you can push with it, one bad thing about it is that you push with it. Um, Yep. 
But like, Inch yeah. like we were said, the Renekton has been really comfortable being under Atlas's tower this entire mm -hmm. game. He's trying to deny him CS just by standing in the CS, which is just really effective for Renekton. Again, using Ruthless Predator into Call the Meek, and just a lot of damage there, and a lot of HP restore for him, so it's really hard to trade efficiently against him. Um, he's obviously still playing the way he would normally, despite the fact that Zarius is up here. They're thinking about taking this top tower, and they can easily secure it if Ethlis goes a little bit further out. And that should be him dead here. Especially, yep, no flash on him. So Ethlis is going to drop here. A little bit closer than it could have been, but in the end, you can't really do anything about Jarvan and Renekton taking you out. But they are going to try and trade Dragon on this for the kill on top lane, which should bring them back to being, well, slightly behind on gold now that the tower's down. Yeah, they're still that little bit behind on gold, and perhaps um, Cyberboy didn't quite need to tank up the tower for as long as that, but they've just lost two turrets for a dragon, so it's three turrets to O, 1,600 gold difference, and you look at it, it's slowly, very slowly snowballing in Powerbellum's favour here. It'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see how this mid-game starts to develop, because that mid, mid lane turret for Powerbellum is very low, Fluke could push that down quite easily, but the rest of the turrets are still pretty high on health, and... I'd like to see Parabellum group up as a four somewhere, try and push a second tier turret, maybe bring Renekton down now that Nasus has to push that wave back out. If Renekton comes down to mid, get three men in that mid lane, might be able to put a bit of pressure down. Mm -hmm. well, of course, the one problem is that when you're roaming as four trying to start a 4v4, it can easily turn into a 4v5. Even if Nasus is in top lane, he does still have his teleport. Now his ulti is down, but it will be back up very, very shortly, about 20 seconds on it. Um, yeah. And Yucatan gets scouted out there by a uh, really nice use of the traps. So he has to use his little... Whatchamacallit? Glacier Path. That's the one to get out. Uh, Renekton getting spotted by all the wards that have been up constantly on this bot river uh, for Team Fluke. Mm -hmm. Like, the Vortex is doing a really good job of trying to keep constant vision on that river, but it's kind of costing him. He only has a Reju bead health potion and uh, ruby crystal. All 3,500 gold that he has gotten this game has gone on those three items and pink wards. Now yeah. it's really effective to do that because it means that you're denying a lot of vision to your enemy, but at the same time, um, Ophelos Annie is going to slowly, slowly creep ahead and go to actually gain items, get that ruby side stone for free vision, and there's not much that uh, Vortex can do about it. Half guess is actually Although, coming behind oh. them here. Yep, really good engage on him there. Flash over, flip kicking Caitlyn back in. But even with the best of openings, it's really hard to pick anything up right here. Tibbers gets dropped, and it looks like there's a teleport coming in from Nasus for the cleanup. He's gonna go straight onto Ophelo, which was a bit of a mistake if you ask me. He could have gone onto Lotus Beta and taken her out instead. Um, we're gonna see Fluke Johnny trade kills with the Gragas, and it goes a 3 for 4 there. Um, on with Renekton still pushing top lane. Just the use of that teleport by Nasus. He didn't even have to blow ulti for that, and they managed to come out just a little bit ahead in that fight. Now I feel... Like, I felt at the time that Ethalus could have gone straight for Caitlyn and just killed mm -hmm. her off. But at the same time, not doing that meant that she felt confident enough to use her ulti, which meant she hung around the fight a little bit longer than she needed to, and meant that Ethalus could take out both Annie and uh, Caitlyn without any yeah. real worry, especially because Corky was able to trade deaths with Akragas, which I believe winds up in favor of Fluke Johnny. I think he yeah. was worth... I think Gragas was worth a little bit more gold as he was on the screen. Um, Unfortunately, no... Hmm? Yeah, I think one of the major things in that fight was there's a nice engage by Hapkes. He flashed over and used that Dragon Ridge kick to get Lotus Beta on Caitlyn into the middle of the fight. But Lotus Beta flashed straight out, they weren't able to get her locked down, and then a superb Tibbers with a Cataclysm hit <laughs> three people. Really, really nicely done. Managed to lock them down and do a lot of damage to them. I'd like to actually see how much AP she had. She's only got 10 HP, and Tibbers did massive amounts of damage, coming down for 200 damage <laughs> with that AoE stun as well. And they were able to clean it up a little bit. Everyone was on such low health from the Parabella team. But then the teleport came in. They managed to get that teleport in, got the frozen tomb down onto Lotus Beta, locked her up. Teleport came in, uh, Offalo went down, Xeris went down, 
and Yimko went down to Johnny, as you said, with that exchange of shutdown goals. Low speed of stayed around a little bit too long, got caught out at the end, but <laughs> it was a very, very close fight. And if you look at it, before the fight, Parabella were in the lead, and now the gold lead is ever so slightly in the favor of Fluke. Mm -hmm. uh, one interesting thing coming out of that fight though is, of course, finally, Vortex has finished off his Sightstone. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is, because he's gone with the Sightstone, and that's his only, like, kind of grab bag of cash, and he's managed to be a little bit further ahead, and has now picked up her very own oracles, which means that all the wards that are getting put down on anywhere that uh, Offlo winds up roaming onto will get mm -hmm. picked up, and there will be a significant lack of vision just because of that. And in goes half gets. Ooh, yeah, in goes half gets. The... Uh oh, unfortunately done by Vortexy there. It was meant he tried to follow up the uh, death sentence, but instead of following it up, he accidentally cast the box back behind the wall meaning that no damage and no slow was done with it. Alright, so they've dropped a tier 2 here, um, in terms of towers, Parabellum have, I mean, and in exchange they've got to lose about half health on one of their tier 2s in bot lane, and they're going to potentially lose their tier 1 in top. Meanwhile, they're taking the inhib tower, and yeah. Nasus has not got his TP up. He's going to have to keep pushing and hopefully take out a tower on this. Uh, and Fluke Johnny, I'm not sure how much he'll be able to do, especially with Lotus Beta Zeres and Unko still up. He might be able to barely pick off uh, Zeres, but it will cost him his life if he goes out. Ace in the hole! Oh, so close! So mm, close, almost got the kill down there. Yeah. Combination of barrier, vortexy shield, and just having enough wherewithal to be able to survive that. It's one of the biggest problems with the Ace in the Hole Ultimate is that it's very, very easy to react to because it has that, what is it, two second setup time? Yeah. Or a second setup time? It feels a lot longer than a single second. Mm. I think it's one and a half, like, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, it, there's enough time to be able to react to it, either to bodily block it or to be able to react with like a barrier or a, a Thresh Lantern. Are they really going to be going for a Baron here? Apparently so, and that's very odd, especially since there's a ward in the back that they haven't cleared out. I think they've noticed it now. Yeah. They put a pick ward down and then didn't clear out the other ward. And they didn't even have Corky there. Johnny was down trying to solo oh. this dragon, which is another interesting choice. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, especially considering that's warded, and now Umko and uh, Lotus Vita are there like, Hey, that's ours. Y you leave that alone. We're taking that. Thanks for starting it. Oh, Umko just wants to get Fluke Johnny here. He's tired of this fly boy like, floating around in his toboggan. Uh, obviously just being able to take Dragon freely there. Fluke Johnny getting cut off from both sides. Now there's not much that Lotus Beta will be able to do to him, especially considering she used her 90 caliber net to get over the wall there. But like, Fluke Johnny just constantly using the Phage passive, trying to stay just one step ahead. But oh! not gonna work, gets knocked back. Beautiful ulti. Just beautiful ulti from Ko there. Yeah, very well played. I mean, like... Johnny was very out of position, but it was a a beautiful mm -hmm. ultimate by Yumko to get him in the middle of that Valkyrie and knock him back towards the rest of his team. One thing I do want to note though mm -hmm. is the amount that Ethlas here on NASA has been able to free farm. He's got 438 stacks on that Siphoning Strike and that's going to be doing a lot of damage especially since he's gone Manduin's Triforce like Fade procs, extra movement speed, Mercury tries to get that bit of magic resistance, and then the Randuins to get that attack speed slow on everyone around him when he activates it, and a little bit of a movement speed slow as well. Really, really mm -hmm. strong item setup there by Athlas on Nasus. Yep. Uh, we're seeing actually a really... a very tanky team coming out for uh, Team Fluke here. Um, and there's only one purely tanky player for Team uh, Parabellum, which means that in a team fight, it's gonna take a lot more to actually bring down even one member of Team Fluke. Like we saw it on the bot lane fight, where Nasus burned TP to come in at the end of it. Mm -hmm. That even though we saw a Tibbers drop on three people and a Cataclysm lockdown with it, it didn't instantly kill everybody. Everyone was still like hanging around quarter health, just a little bit above a quarter health. Even like the AD carry was able to hang around long enough to go off and do a trade kill. Which isn't yeah. something that you would normally be able to see. Normally, like, the AD carry kind of wilts like a delicate little flower under fire. Especially considering that um, at, this, at the point of the state, point of the game where that occurred, the AP carry should be able to burst down the AD carry harder than the AD carry should be able to keep up. Yes, that Fluke makes Johnny sense, yes. Baiting in, yeah. We're seeing Fluke Johnny starting to bait in here. 
Uh, Flash, I think, got burned there by Cyberboy ITT. Thresh drops the box, trying to lock out Caitlyn and uh, Gragas from the fight. Good Flash there to get out of Cataclysm, and uh, oh, everyone's just going down left and right. NASA's wielding that giant ass goddamn wither, and just the damage out of him right now. The damage! 510 damage on Withering Strike, just showing off. Yeah. Just standing there in the back line, using that uh, Randian's Omen after we saw the ulti go down from Lysandra onto, I believe it was down on Umko, which was a really good call. His damage output is insane, and Gragas' mobility with Body Slam should never really be underestimated. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, they're not able to get anything off winning this team fight. Uh, two for four, I believe. Two for four. Yeah. Um, or three for four, even. Um, because they have that inhibitor down and every lane is pushing in. This is one of the unfortunate things about fighting too close to your own base. Even if you win the team fight, there's not a whole lot you can get out of it. Yeah, and that's one of the problems. Right? Nasus teleport there, again showing how much mobility this team has. Nasus was in top lane, teleported down, was able to get there and secure a triple kill in the end of it, which is superb. Mm -hmm. Puts them about 2,000 gold in the lead. They have still got that inhibitor in mid lane down though, and they're going to be. It's respawning soon, so it means within the next 30 seconds that will be back up and operational. And I think what we're probably going to see is them push out these lanes, try and get a bit of pressure going down, and then they'll rotate round towards a Baron. Mm hmm. Like, I still can't get over that cheeky Baron slash cheeky dragon that they tried to pull. Mm. You know, where they walked into the pit with a pink ward on the outside and didn't drop it. Yeah. Like, they didn't kill off the pink ward. And we're seeing, like, Corky's up in top lane now, and the enemy team knows it, and it looks like they just got to send him home. Um, it looks like Team Parabellum are going to try and do a big push through in mid, but they're only four, and it's not like they're and has a teleport as well. I, they they must know. Oh, Vortexy, look at the damage on Vortexy! Yeah, this is... Ooh, in goes Lee Sin. Gets the flip kick out on Zeris. He was obviously looking for Lotus Beta, but Lotus Beta very carefully positioned himself just a little bit out of the way. Uh, Fluke Johnny standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jarvan and not even giving a good goddamn. Tibbers is out. The stun's gone. For uh, Victor, uh, Yumko is losing a little bit of HP here, but he's got to move away. Just a little bit of the use of that mobility. Offalo uh, has the Wither on him, which means Lotus Beta is free to just walk in and right-click down. Uh, Yumko standing at the very edge of this fight, still throwing in barrels. Cyberboy ITT goes down to Nasus. Nasus heading over to try and deal with Yumko here. Flash from Offalo. Not entirely sure what that was about. Um, Ithalus just barely hanging on. Goes down in the end. Vortexy, no HP. Yucatan, no HP. Gotta come out of that. Oh, Unfortunately, he went just the wrong direction. Was about to grab that lantern. I don't think he would have been saved there either way. Just because of Caitlyn's range. The bullet was already in the air when he went down. This inhibitor is going to drop, I think. Oh, Lee Sin with the home guard boost coming out. Gonna try for something snazzy here. Manages to hit the Q onto Lotus Beta doesn't want to follow it up. He's all on his own. Lotus Beta is carrying around a red buff. It would be very, very difficult for him to go in on this. He's got two people on him. Uh, Lotus Beta goes back because of the dragon kick, but it looks like she's not going to give a good goddamn, and Lee Sin is going to drop for his troubles. Second late with the lantern, unfortunately. But yeah, like, I think there was a couple of crits in there. Hafka's mm -hmm. needed to accept that that inhibitor was going to go down. Yes, you can try and save it, but there's no use going all out, especially against the two carries from the other team. Like, Lotus Beta has that Bloodthirster and Static Shiv. Yumko has Zonya's Hourglass, Needlessly Large Rod, and an Abyssal Scepter. Like, you don't want to be going in on that. You don't want to be trying to counteract that. And it actually looks like <laughs> Yumko is going to build towards a Deathfire Grasp, which isn't the most commonly seen item on Gragas, but does help out with his burst potential. If you Deathfire Grasp <laughs> someone into a barrel and explosive cast, 90% of the time they are going to go down. What I would like to see, yep. uh, I was about to say what I would like to see is for Lotus Space to get a last whisper and she has gone and done that. So there's lots of armor here on the Fluke team and she really wasn't melting Nasus at the speed that she'd like to. So that last whisper is going to help out a lot with that. Mm -hmm. And carrying around the red paw right now. Obviously mm -hmm. not going to Taria Chug it before the fight starts. She's not 6 loaded, so there's no point actually doing it. Yucatan taking a lot of hurt here. Ace in the hole about to come out. Oh, she manages to Zonya herself and drop the... Freeze, uh, and we see Cataclysm come out from Jarvan. Yucatan, nearly any health left on him. Really, really nice shot there from Fluke Johnny. Oh, the rockets! <laughs> Triple kill on the... Those rockets, man.
We saw the power of the yeah, rockets like there, yeah. with the spellblade passive as well coming at uh, spellblade passive coming out from Triforce. Huge mm -hmm. amounts of damage on them. They do activate any on hit abilities, and it means that if you land a big one, it's going to do 150% extra damage as well. And that is uh, sorry, 200% extra damage, not 150. And that is a lot and it's 200%. Isn't it 200% bonus of base physical damage? Yeah, it is. Which yep. I believe for Corky is pretty reasonably high, but I can't really check it. Because they're gonna. That's not his base though. That's oh, the that's base not his plus base. modifier. Yeah, right. I think. So. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think it's only base, which isn't huge, but it is quite useful. Um, they got hit by a trap. It was Yucatan, but he's fine. He's fine. So Baron was probably their best bet there. Mm -hmm. Everyone was responding too soon for them to be able to push their lanes back in to get a tower, and the inhibitor had just gone down. Baron was definitely their best option. The dragon here might be a little bit cheeky, but with Nasus, with Lee Sin, they should be okay to take it. And yeah, then, nice and easy for them. yeah, should be able to just walk out. That Nasus is a big, big threat here. That Spirit Visage, the uh, Triforce, and the Randian Zomen. He's incredibly tanky. His damage output is insane. He's about to hit 600. The next creep he kills will give him that 600 siphoning strike. Siphoning strike, I believe, can crit as well. It can. Um, and that's just insane. And Triforce gives Nasus everything he needs in that department. Yeah, I mean, the critical strike chance is intense. Actually, the highest crit in the game was recorded about two weeks ago, I think. It might be a month ago. And it was 22,000 damage crit with a Nasus with a fully stacked Q. Well, not with a fully stacked Q, but with a massively stacked Q and a 100% crit chance and an infinity edge. So obviously we're not going to see a 20,000 damage crit here, but Siphoning Sight can crit and wow. Nasus has actually gone last whisper as oh his dear. fourth item. I don't, I don't agree with it as such, but I can totally understand why it's been done. Negating that extra armor coming out from the Renekton, some fire cave and mandarins, the Aegis, uh, the Locket of the Iron Salai, sorry, on the Jarvan, the Zonya's Hourglass on Gragas. That is going to be doing a lot of damage in these team fights coming mm -hmm. up. Yep. And obviously, while they have Baron buff up here, Team Fluke are looking to take this mid tower down. They're 7,000 gold in the lead, but they are an inhibitor down. Um, it's all about how this next fight goes on. Now, they don't have Corky. He's off split pushing. So, this is obviously just a siege going down on the mid lane here. Um, they're probably hoping that someone will go top, try to deal with Corky, and then they'll be able to take on a 4v. A 4v4 and win comfortably with the Baron buff is all that they're mm -hmm. looking for here. I'm Unless not sure why if... they've sent Corky up. They could send Yucatan or Ethlas. Both of them have their teleports up. Why don't you just send one of them to the other lane? Let uh, them push. Potentially because Corky seems so much more like a threat. And if they split off their team and try to take out Corky uh, really, really aggressively, like send two or three people up to deal with them, two defensive teleports in on the wave with Corky means that mm -hmm. suddenly. Um, all that needs to happen is half gets and vortex. You just need to put there it is like I yeah. said They're sending up their two big cannons in top lane and suddenly the big body block that you did in mid lane Is completely irrelevant because you just lost your inhibitor tower and your inhibitor. Yeah, that's true that's Very well played that actually by the fluke team. Look at the offload damage. Wow, two Q's Two siphons One Q and a crit and he just went yeah. down. Ooh, fluke Johnny takes the ace and the whole damage and here's the damage Just Renekton getting shredded They've let the game go on. It's only 30 minutes in, so it doesn't even feel like it's that late. But Nasus was just left free farm a little bit too long. Use of that teleport meant that he was never fully out of position. Oh, half get it. Cheeky cheeky, just barely getting away. They're gonna drop these two Nexus turrets. There's nothing that a solo Kalen can do about this. The GG comes out, and that's it. Yeah, well played there by Fluke. Managing to pick up the first of this best of two. It's not mm -hmm. a best of two technically, I guess. It's two games. Kind of a best of two. Anyway, Fluke picking up the first of the best of two against Power Bellum. Really well played there by Ethlas in that top lane, going 12, 3, and 2 on Nasus with 284 CS and 35 minute game. Pretty well done by him. Mm -hmm. I mean, credit also to Johnny, 11, 5, and 8 on that call, he with the most CS in the game, out CSing his opponent by 100, which is a huge amount. Um, mm -hmm. We will be back in a couple of minutes for the next game. I am Sona, and my co caster today is Voa. We will see you guys mm -hmm. in just a couple of minutes.